Hi everyone, I'm Don Rooney. And I'm John Timpain. Welcome to the Musical Inner Two, the podcast born out of a mistake. We once meant to introduce a soothing musical interlude, but we said soothing musical inner tube and the name stuck. On this podcast, we talk to interesting people about their interesting lives, jobs, hobbies, and passions. Difference makers who really make a difference. At one time, the minivan touted as the perfect vehicle, was seemingly everywhere on American roads. But after a sales peak of $1.3 million in 2000, sales had declined almost 80%. What happened and why? Here today to discuss his recent Atlantic article titled The Death of the Minivan is Ian Bogost. Ian is a much-published writer, cultural commentator, and video game designer, He's also a professor at Washington University in St. Louis, and of course, as we just said, he's a contributing editor at The Atlantic. Welcome to the musical inner tube, Ian. Hey, thanks so much for having me. You bet. We really loved reading The Death of the Minivan. Um, oh, thanks so much. It was fun to do. For the better part of two decades, minivans seem to be everywhere. I ought to know. Yeah. I personally drove two of them into the ground. Right. <laughs> but now only four makers sell such cars, as you point out. And it's it's such a great read, very sharply perceptive. So let's begin by asking you, what kind of vehicle vehicle did you ride in as a child? And what are your memories of it? Oh, wow. Okay, so we had uh, land yachts when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> uh, I remember the first car I remember riding in was my parents, uh, like 1970 Oldsmobile Delta 88. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Bench seat in front. You just kind of slid around back and forth on the vinyl. Mm-hmm. Then in in the early uh, '80s, they got a a Buick, like a giant Buick, and similar kind of similar kind of car. Um, so that's the kind of car I rode in. We never had a a minivan or a or a station wagon when I was a kid. But man, those cars were big. Did you have good feelings about getting into it as a kid, or was it just you know the workhorse? I mean, I remember the car as being a place that I generally didn't want to be. I think this is true of most most kids in America where you're, you're stuck in the car, you know, you don't have, yep. you don't have anything to do. You're being carted somewhere that you maybe didn't choose to go or that you did choose to go, but it still takes a long time to get there because you live in America and it takes a long time to drive places or you're on the road. Um, I grew up in the, in the Southwestern U S and you know, the distance between actual places was so vast uh, that hours and hours and hours sitting there and we didn't have, you know, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have like iPads and stuff. So you would, you would, you know, you know, do activity books or play cards or or, or whatever. So I think boredom was a, a a standout sense of of automobile life in the city or out of it. Sure. Yeah, I remember when I was uh, a kid. Uh, I don't know if my dad was ahead of the curve or whatever, but this was in the late sixties, early seventies, and he got himself a van. A small, a, a smaller van, but it, like one of those box vans, like yeah. a delivery van, except it had seats in it. And, um, the, the engine for the van was between the two front seats. Sure. In, inside the car. And, um, so when we got in there, we would fill in the back seats and, uh, we had a real large family. My parents had eight kids. So at one point, my father got the great idea of putting a piece of foam on the engine cover, and that would become another seat. Well, you didn't want to be the kid that <laughs> sat on the seat because that got really hot really fast. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he had that van for years. Uh, talk about driving something into the ground. He kind of, when we got old enough to drive ourselves, he kind of gave it to my uh, one of my younger brothers who then literally drove it into something. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> yeah. But- uh, but that was a workhorse and that was, uh, very early on. And again, you're right. Most of the other families that we dealt with had station wagons. That was the big yeah, thing at the that time. Was the family car. And, you know, the, right. the, the Volkswagen microbus, of course, predated the, you know, the, the family van, uh, that yep. big boxy, um, front, right. flat fronted truck. But that, that wasn't, that wasn't seen as a, as a family vehicle initially and eventually became kind of a very Euro oriented you know, camper, uh, conversion, so to speak. Yes. Uh, but those were like driving a room around, you know, um, <laughs> yes, your <laughs> box, your room, you know, um, it, it seems to me, and you've written about, uh, uh, pleasure and boredom in different ways yeah, in, right. in your writing, Ian, and it, 
it occurs to me as you were speaking, I have heard so many people talk about their experience of being basically captives as kids and going on long drives, often often pointless. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I heard um, an interview with Bruce Springsteen just the other day where he said his dad used to just pile everybody into the, their two-tone Ford station wagon, which I remember because we had one in the 50s, and just driving. And he used to look out the window and watch the telephone wires go up and down, up and down yeah, for hours. Right. Yeah, yeah, that sort of rhythm. The, um, I mean, the idea of driving as an activity unto itself is is also it's a it's a very old one, uh, and you know the idea of the touring car, which we still sometimes like. You can get like Chrysler Pacifica minivan in the like the touring trip, you know, and it's like, well, what does that mean? That's just a name for it, you know. But a hundred years ago, a touring car was a car that you just you just drove around to drive it, and you know, just to be on the road uh, as a kind of activity unto itself, and then like that idea of the parkway. Uh, that arose and you know, sort of very, very famous for Robert Moses and others for their design of these parkways for, for people to enjoy the pleasure of, of driving, of being, of being in the car and you couldn't be there if you weren't in a car. But, but that, that pleasure and of course the, you know, the associated uh, displeasure of being in the vehicle is it's, it's something that's just very American and very, very much attached to the American experience uh, of the automobile. Um, uh, partly because we had such vast distances, but we, you know, with respect to the minivan or the wagon, by the time we get to the late sixties or the early seventies, uh, you know, suburbia has fully happened. And so there, there is just for most people, for most families, there's distance, uh, between home and work, uh, between the places that you would need to go, uh, in your daily life. Yeah. I, well, I remember some of those, uh, drives that we took the Sunday drives, um, were to uh, my grandmother's house, and that was a good hour away because we were in the suburbs, and yeah. she was still. Uh, this was outside Los Angeles, and she was in Southgate, which is a, a, a bedroom community in LA, but still pretty much within the scope of the of the megalopolis. And we were in Orange County. We moved, yeah, well, out gosh, to yeah. the suburb, to the real suburbs. Uh, and so, yeah, it was uh, just to get to grandmother's house for a Sunday dinner was an hour drive, and. Um, and before the interstate system fully established oh, yes, itself, yeah. right? Well, we would take roads through Long Beach and through other cities, yeah. where we we would uh, the the amount of time we spent in the car was added to because of all the stoplights and all yeah. the downtowns we had to go through. You oh know, my there, God! There's something I didn't I didn't get to talk about in the story. There's a sort of brief mention of it with uh, you know people need more. More room in their cars. This is what I said in the story. There's people need more room in their cars these days because they have more kids and, and the kids have bigger car seats and the car seats have, they have to be in them for a longer period. Uh, but, you know, back in, in the seventies and even in the eighties and before, certainly we, you know, we talk about like piling into the car, piling the kids into the car. Yes. It's really meant yes. you just like throw as many people in as possible. Yeah. They would be in the bed with these like jump seats in the back of the station wagon or you just kind of fit as many people on those bed seats as you, as you could. Uh, and you know, that experience of being strapped in to your own little pilot seat, you know, like my kids had, uh, that wasn't the, that wasn't always the case. And, and I do think that made, I mean, obviously it wasn't as safe, although, you know, maybe we've overextended our, our obsession with, with, with safety at, at other costs. Um, but it was, it was a way of being a little freer, you know, a little more in your own body rather than in the car. I love the locution piling into the car because yeah. we all used it. And one of its connotations is pre seatbelt. It's just get in quickly, a lot of you. Yeah. And so, yeah, then there was something we used to call it the way back was this enormously distant section of the car. <laughs> <laughs> right, Don? I mean, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's all the way back there. And it was very uncomfortable, these little sort of flip up seats. Right. And often, often that's where all the little kids were sent. And so there might be up to five of us sort of holding on for dear F and life as we're running. It's, it's so, sort of interesting how piling into the car uh, these days, strangely enough, and maybe it's because of that emphasis on safety, you don't pile anymore. You can't pile. You really got to. Yeah, it's, it's just a relic. We, we, we sometimes use the word, but we don't really meet it any longer. I mean, the things that, that people used to do in vehicles or the way that they used to ride in them, I mean, it was you know, by, by contemporary standards, just, just bananas. I, I, I remember having a friend as a kid who's, uh, he had this kind of like slimy, 
you know, early eighties dad, you know, his only jacket kind of, kind of, he bought this. I can see him. Yeah. I can see yeah, him. You, yeah, yeah. You know, everything about it just from that. <laughs> yep. Yep. He bought this Porsche 944 and, uh, you know, like a two seaters, but we would still, you know, I would, I would go, go visit him. We would still like get two or three or four kids somehow into that two seater Porsche, like people stacked in the, in the back hatch somehow. Yeah. Like, yeah. Just, just banana stuff that you would, you would never do anymore, you know, you know, it's just not, oh, yeah. it's not, and, and it, it wasn't good at the time. It was really more just that there was this kind of uh, exploration of the interiority of, of vehicles. And I think, you know, that experimentation, which was happening in the sixties and seventies, you know, the, the design of the minivan happens in the late 1970s, um, that we've kind of lost that. Like all cars are the same now. And you, they, I mean, wh- you, they all look like sneakers is kind of the line I use. They look like, they yeah. look like shoes. Yeah, yeah, they they like do. Shoes. They do. Yeah. Um, I mean, as, as much as people love to hate the, the Tesla cyber truck, uh, mostly perhaps because they have bad feelings about Tesla or Elon Musk, it is at least something different. It's something different on the road, which we haven't, we haven't really had for a very long it's time. It's kind of breathtaking. It's sort of like, I, I find it startlingly ugly. And yet when I see one, it's so different, at least for now. Maybe everything will go that way and everybody will drive their own Batmobile. But yeah. it's it's true about the te- Tesla design. It's meant, it's really very aggressive. And yeah. it just, re- yeah, it you is. know. It is. that, that It's larger than, than it seems when you see one in person. It, it feels hulking in, in a way that I, I didn't expect, at least. And, you know, there have been a, kind of a long history of those those startling vehicle designs, uh, things that you'd never seen before. And the minivan was certainly one of them when it, when it first arrived in 83, you know, seeing them was like, wow, oh my gosh, you have that new minivan. And, and, and there have been better and worse versions of it. You know, there's like the, um, the, um, um, uh, that Pontiac Aztec, you know, that ghastly. <laughs> oh yeah. The, oh yeah. The, the Chrysler PT cruiser had that feature for oh, a while. Man. Oh the, yeah. A, a lot of Chrysler cars actually, what was that Dodge that, that had that sort of, uh, sort of swoopy hot rod kind of look. I can't remember the name of the model. Um, um, and, and, you know, the, it's rare these days to, to see novelty in design, uh, on, right. you know, not, not just in the auto show or in the concept car. I had to, to question, um, the PT cruiser and who exactly they were aiming it to. What I, in my experience, it wound up being purchased by old people, <laughs> by people in their 60s and 70s, I guess because it was a throwback car. It looked like a 30s car, you yeah. know. Yeah, it had um, that throwback. It had that throwback. I, I owned one for a little while, and um, it, was, it wasn't it was a great car, but it, I remember in those early days, it, it would get looks. You know, the, the, the valet would park it close. Maybe that's the test. <laughs> Yeah, just to to give a little extra pizzazz. Right. Uh, one last thing to uh, to to the safety that that I recall where we were going to uh, uh, baseball games, where the entire uh, nine or ten man team would pile in the back of one of the father's uh, uh, yes. pickup trucks and ride in an open pickup truck. Oh with yeah, nothing holding us down. Sure. Uh, and hoping that we would hit a bump, so we would all kind of fly up in the air. Yeah, yeah. we. Yeah, it's. I mean, a, a kind of stereotypically common, you know, American roadway scene, really. You know, and if you saw that today, you'd be you'd be a gas. It'd be all over the internet. Exactly, and uh, probably the cops would pull him over and and oh, yeah. ticket him, and the guy yeah. couldn't go any farther. Yeah, be, yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be. Uh, what was interesting also in your article was the evolution of the minivan um, uh, into eventually. Um, the SUV, yeah, and how that took over. Um, and I, I was wondering, uh, in your article, you say basically people got bored with the minivan because it was so utilitarian, and kind of the SUV uh, because it was based on a four by four, which was an off road kind of experience. That sort of tempted people to get out of the rut of the minivan and get into something that quote was more exciting. Yeah, I mean, th- there's this concept in advertising uh, called uh, associative uh, uh, marketing, associative advertising. And yeah. basically, the principle of it is, you know, instead of telling you about the properties of the product, hey, here's what it can do for you. It's got it's got three rows of seats, for example. Uh, associative advertising uh, connects a product with some aspiration or some concept, some lifestyle. Most marketing today is sort of lifestyle marketing like that. We don't really use things anymore. We sort of pretend to be certain kinds of people with them. 
And the uh, the SUV evolved out of the the four by four, as he said. And there was a time when you know if you owned a four by four, well, first of all, it was a truck. It was a big truck. It was it was heavy duty. It was uncomfortable to ride in. It was difficult to drive. Uh, it got terrible a uh, gas mileage. It rode like a truck. Uh, so if you had like a, a suburban or, or one of those, uh, you know, the best you could do is like those uh, uh, those Jeeps. You know, um, the, uh, the the smaller one was the the Cherokee at the time, or the uh, you know the right. The, what was the one? The, the wood paneling, the Wagoneer. Um, yeah. Oh my and, goodness. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's uh, that's another kind of classic uh, family car of, of, of the seventies. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, they were, they were, their purpose, their functional purpose was having four wheel drive. So you could, uh, you know, drive it in bad weather or off road. Um, but you know, this is America and that sort of open road association with the wilderness, with, with being in, in nature, with forging your own path and not taking the freeway and not taking the city boulevards. That's a very strong notion. And when you're sitting there in traffic in your station wagon or in your minivan later, and you realize I am just one of, of the rats in the rat race and it's a different kind of rat race. I'm taking my kids to baseball instead of getting to work. You start to feel like your soul is, lo- is lost. Um, <laughs> and I, I do think that the, the decline of the minivan or this, this sort of uncool association the minivan had isn't, isn't so much about the design of the vehicle. It became associated with the design. But it was first about the uncoolness of family life, of, of parenthood, of, the, of the, the duties and obligations that came with all of the things that the minivan facilitated. And the, this SUV, it didn't arrive. It wasn't new. But it began to be more drivable. Uh, they were based more on, on auto chassis. Uh, they had front-wheel drive instead of four-wheel drive, which is hilarious. <laughs> um, you could, you know, you, they, 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 they fit more people slightly but usually they weren't three row seats um they had a hatch which is you know extremely useful no matter what kind of car you have but mostly they had that association with with being um being out of the city out of your life someone else somewhere else and that association i think is what is what drove the the rise of the uh, of the suv and its takeover of um uh of the american roads because like on paper it is absolutely less useful. It's a worse car for families. Oh, it, it, it's it is. And Ian, you know, I've been thinking about the the SUV since reading your article. I realize the SUV has changed the uh, the available landscape to drivers that don't drive SUVs because SUVs are tall. You can't see around them, and so in in traffic jams, there's really very little forward vision. Yeah, it's a ve- very strange knock-on effect of everybody driving the same kind of car no that's right and and people when when they experience that they think well next time i get a car you know i better get one of these high up vehicles so i can see yes on the road around me so i can feel safer and that just creates this kind of snowball uh, effect <laughs> and you know you can trace that yeah. sentiment um you know way back i mean decades even in the late 80s uh it became um as these these, these kind of vehicles became uh, increasingly popular they, ha- they hadn't yet um become as popular as they did in the late 90s it's really when the suv boom really started uh but people would say you know gosh i can't see over these cars anymore on the road you know i'm going to get uh, a truck or even a minivan that was one of the motivations for people who didn't need a minivan to get one because it sat a little higher uh, on the yes road. yes you heard it all the time we'll be back to our podcast in just a moment but first here's a soothing musical interlude Ian Bogost is a writer, cultural commentator, and video game designer. He earned his BA in Philosophy and Comparative Literature from USC and his MA and PhD in Comparative Literature from UCLA. His award-winning video games include Cow Clicker, a satire on video games, Jet Set, a game for airports, and Guru Meditation. Ian is also Barbara and David Thomas Distinguished Professor at Washington University in St. Louis, as well as Professor and Director of Film and Media Studies and Professor of Computer Science and Engineering. His books include Alien Phenomenology, or What It's Like to Be a Thing, and Play Anything, 
The Pleasure of Limits, The Uses of Boredom, and The Secret of Games. He's also a contributing editor to The Atlantic, where the article, The Death of the Minivan, came from. For more about Ian, check out his author page at The Atlantic website, theatlantic.com slash author slash Ian hyphen Bogost. That's I-A-N hyphen B-O-G-O-S-T. And now we return you to the musical inner tube already in progress. And there was a, a, a thing, I think maybe late 90s, early 2000s, uh, where uh, I, w- I was reporting on television and I got sent out to a lot of stories uh, where there was a trend of bigger cars. Mm-hmm. Where trucks were the, the were the best selling cars, the Ford F one fifty was selling thousands and thousands or millions of cars uh, every year as the top seller, and of course this was right around the time when people were starting to get worried about uh, fuel consumption and also the the emissions that these cars were right. putting out. Right. So that was a big conflict there. There was one group of people that were saying we can't have these big cars because they're you know, they're tough on the roads and they're tough on the environment. And then there was America saying, I want a huge car. Yeah. Yeah. And that never really changed. You know, we go through cycles, you know, we've had these many cycles of concerns about fuel economy and cycles about concerns about the environment. You're right about the wear on the road, but the heavier the car is, uh, the more it wears the roads, all the minivans are hardly light. Um, but you know, we we live in a market economy and people they vote with their wallets and uh america has said i want big truck like cars um that's what i want to drive and you know there's just fewer and fewer options on the road in general in a lot of ways like the, the i i can't point to the um the data on this right now off the top of my head but the the variety of colors of cars have also reduced there's basically black white gray maybe one other. And if you look at a parking lot, go to Target or something, look at the parking lot. It's all these monotone uh, colors in the, in the lot. Uh, and you, you know, used to have all sorts of, all sorts of color, blue and red and yellow and sure. Olive green or whatever, you know, avocado. Um, so that's another sign of just the way that the whole um, marketplace of vehicles has homogenized. And of course, at the same time as all this is happening, you've got this kind of culture war conflict where people who are, you could say fortunate, I suppose they would say fortunate, fortunate enough to live in, you know, dense modernist American cities of which there are very few where they can take public transit and they, they can walk, they can bike, they can use micro mobility services like, like scooters or e-bikes are increasingly popular, you know, and, and that has created this sort of sense that it's even worse to own these vehicles that are, you know, hard on the roads and hard in the environment and burning fuel, even though we're trying to electrify uh, and, and, you know, so that dynamic has only become kind of more like everything, I guess, in, in America, more polarized. Yes, it's interesting. Uh, this is a bit far afield from our topic, but it is true that there are several cities in the United States, very large ones, too, which have available very good public transportation services. And their biggest issue is getting people to use them. And uh, uh, San Diego has a bit of a problem with this. I know Philadelphia does. I I reported on Philadelphia for 20 years, and they actually have a pretty good uh, transit system, but they can't persuade people, you know, enough people from most of the city. They Certainly people in center city don't like to use the bus for certain social reasons, which are some of which are not appetizing at all. Oh, no, it's, it's usually, it's usually, um, uh, you know, related to per- perceptions of, of economic class or of, or of race. You know, Absolutely. The buses yeah. and trains are for, for poor, pe- poor people or brown people. We don't want to be around them. And, and the growth of, of, of transit systems in America and most, most cities, not all of them, of course, the growth of transit, uh, there was large investment in it in the mid century, which is kind of exactly when all of the, the civil rights activism was taking place. And so there was a lot of white flight concerns, the same reasons that people were moving out um, to the suburbs to get away from the city. They didn't want the inner city residents to have access, you know, to them by train or by bus yes. out in the suburbs. And, you know, while that seems like it's unrelated to the arrival of the minivan, it, it, it is related uh, because, you know, as we became more of a car culture, uh, you know, during that period from like 19, 1940 to 1970, by that, by that time was kind of fully entrenched. Then, you know, one of the motivations to, to have a vehicle 
um, was to extract yourself from, from urbanism, from urban life, which was, which had very specific meanings. You know, we didn't think about, you, you say urbanism today and it has, you know, generally positive, uh, yes. connotations and, and it's it changed. Be- the feeling of the, the discussion around urbanism has definitely changed in the last 20 years. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, you, a lot of what we're talking about here, uh, you, you drop, uh, the word semiotics in your, uh, you talk about the dreary semiotics of the minivan. And, uh, for our listeners who are not familiar with the term, uh, and you check me if I'm wrong, Ian, but semiotics is the study of signs of, yeah, that's of right. things that, that have messages that seem to carry messages and sort of, you know, digging into that, you know, what carries the message? What is the signifier? What is the signified? And cars are bristling with signification. Oh, if you look, oh, they yeah, are. if you look at a, a competition yellow Humvee, that's telling you that we're at war and the driver is prepared. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's, that's right. We, we express it, ourselves um, uh, through our, our kind of the, our external trappings, how we self present in the world. And you do that through, you know, the, the hairstyle you choose, the clothes that you wear. And because we spend so much of our time in automobiles in America, and, uh, you know, uh, we, we self present ourselves to others in those automobiles because we're usually driving them alone. So they're kind of an extension of the body. Uh, they represent you. And if you want a, a, a Corvette, um, or if you want a minivan, or if you want to get a, you know, a practical Honda CRV or, or, or Honda Accord, uh, that says something about, about you and who you are. And that's one reason that the minivan has this kind of, they get operate semiotically. That, that choosing to buy a minivan or feeling like you've been backed into the need to buy a minivan, well, like <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that you are, you have settled down into uh, the the ordinary and maybe boring trappings of American family life. Whereas buying that SUV, that still says, you know, I might, I may get out there. There's, there's, yes, still, yeah. there's still an open place for me to discover. Yeah. I can drive down that uh, suburban road, and then when I get to the uh, dirt road, I can take it. Yeah, even though you probably there. can't. Like, the vehicle literally probably can't go on the dirt road. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it doesn't mind to. But it feels, it signifies going onto the dirt road. Right. You wouldn't want to get it all muddy, because then you'd have to wash it. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah some, sometimes I'm behind these big trucks, like in the parking lot or whatever, and, um, you know, they're like inching, creeping over the... um uh, the, the speed bumps, you know, as if they were yes. like, as if they were like dropped, um, yeah. you know, low riders or, 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 you know, or whatever, and, you know, trying to, trying not to, to scrape their undercarriages. Uh, it's like, what are you, you're in the tree on a truck, man. Like, what's your, what's your problem? But people baby their cars, you know, they, they have, um, they have relationships with them. They name them, they clean them. Uh, they, uh, they get upset sometimes to the point of violence if someone does damage, uh, to them. Your automobile in America is you. Exactly. And the biggest piece of revenge you can have against somebody on, on a smaller scale, I guess, is keying their car. Like the worst Remember? thing you can do, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. That's terrible. Yeah. yeah because that's it's terrible. not, it's, it's like a, you know, it's done surreptitiously and it's, it's a kind of damage that doesn't look like damage, doesn't really affect the function of it, but affects the, the aesthetics. It's gas. Yes. It feels like shameful. Yeah. Like, oh, what happened? Uh, and, and just so much kind of dense richness of meaning in that, uh, you know, whereas folks who aren't car people or don't, you know, don't drive cars, they live in cities who live abroad, you know, they would look at this whole culture of keying thing like, what? That's, that's, you, that's, that's, that's something people do. It seems, it seems nuts, you know? Yeah. There was a keying epidemic in San Francisco about six years ago where a gang, they didn't even bother to smash windows, which is what they usually do in San Francisco, but they went keying. Yeah, and it was so unmistakable what the import of that was because it was racial, it was class, yeah, it was the defacement of identity. Saying, "Okay, we know you're richer, we know you live in a better place than we do. You know, you're parked on the street, and you're yep. fair game, and we're going to make you a little bit uglier." Yeah, and there's a there's a pride. You know, they they successfully um you know attacked the the kind of hubristic pride of appearance. You know, that's associated with those sure. Types. Uh, of, of lifestyles in a way that I'm sure got under those those folks' skin in exactly the way um, that that it was that it was intended uh, to do. And you know, I, I mean, this is a little bit far afield, but generally speaking, uh, automobiles are less resilient um, than they used to be. Uh, they're certainly mm-hmm. harder to maintain on your own because they're basically just computers. Uh, but if you, you can't you, you can't work on your own car, and you really can't. It's been a long yeah, time. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, but you used to you used to have they used they used to be less fragile. Uh, you know, keying notwithstanding, uh, you had a bumper on your car. You know, there was an actual piece of of, of rubber. Sure. And if you accidentally you know bumped something, a car you know could like a post when you're parking or even another car to stop. It, it was there to prevent damage. You know, now if you you barely touch it, and you bet like six thousand dollars in in bodywork uh, yes. uh, to, to repair. And I think that has also accelerated the sense of um, of connection and of identity, good and bad, that people have with their cars because they they do feel so fragile, and they make you feel fragile in them. And and you sometimes hear people talk about like feeling um, at risk on the road, or their kids are endangered. Yeah. yeah. So I need a bigger car because there's all these bigger cars, and uh, and that's been around for a while too. You remember the. The like baby on board sign trends that are oh, like yeah. the late 1980s when, when yeah. ro- arose, and that was right around the time you know that that you know the minivan had, was was extremely popular. That sort of notion of of familial driving was was a very much um, mainstream, um, and you know, there was this sense that everyone else is out to get me in, in some way. Like be careful because there are you know I have I have children in my in my vehicle. Even though cars have become uh, by the numbers. Uh, safer. I mean, they're still very dangerous, but they've become safer and safer and safer uh, thanks to all of the different, you know, m- measures of uh, airbags and uh, and restraints. And uh, despite the external appearance and the cost of doing bodywork, they they are safer than they than they once were. Not to mention the practices around them. So all of that does contribute to this sort of sense of, um, you know, your your if your car is yourself, and then your family car is your family represents your family and contains it. That that attachment is both endearing, and you feel very, you know, you feel you know great love and pride for your family, but it also holds you down or holds you back as you are you're stuck in your life. And those are you know just kind of general themes of of midlife, right? You know the sure you know, the the realization that um, your life is great, but this is it. This is all there is. <laughs> yeah, you, there you are. hit the top. And there's yeah. no more. It brings up terms like soccer mom. Right. Suddenly, right. that. That is as ubiquitous as the minivan in, in the uh, late, yeah yeah. I mean that's a concept minutes. very strongly associated with the minivan. Although although you know you see the soccer moms these days who've sort of you know escaped the, the minivan into these large uh, SUVs, and the soccer mom identity somehow persists. Uh, you know something about kind of like especially middle aged motherhood has actually become more desirable, um, both in terms of an identity, even like more sexually desirable. Right these these days. Um, but there, that, that was one of those levers that, uh, they got you into the minivan, but then also got people kind of back out again. They didn't want to be perceived as, uh, uh, as a, as a soccer mom. And, and I think what that means, like just to dig into it a little bit is that it's, it's fine to take your kids to, to youth soccer. Like nobody, nobody's against that. It's rather the sense that that's my whole identity. All I do is cart my kids around to these activities <laughs> and that's what my life has become. That's the sort of depressive sense. Of it. Well, Ian, uh, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful automotive half hour. Um, and we recommend everyone go read The Death of the Midi Man uh, 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 in the Atlantic. It, it has a lively sense of the conversation going on on the roads of America from sea to shining sea just by driving the cars we drive and the meaning of that that act and uh and one of them seems to be either going off stage or changing into something else and that is uh, the minivan so many of us drove so thank you for being our guest today oh yeah thanks so much i had a great time and thank you for listening to the musical inner tube hey let us know how we're doing send us an email at musical inner tube all one word at gmail.com do you know someone with a great story to tell let us know send us an email or log in to our website musicalintertube.com and click on the microphone in the lower right hand corner to leave us a voicemail and while you're on our website take a few minutes to listen to past episodes of the podcast they're all there along with pictures and biographies of our guests blog posts and lots more and as always our thanks to virtual band car radio dog for providing us with our theme music <laughs>